Okay, everybody, um, for our second lecture, we're going to be going back to Europe and we're going to be talking about uh, principally uh, the institution of monarchy and how it changes uh, in the modern period compared to what we've already talked about in class uh, as characteristic of medieval monarchy. So what we're going to see are some really significant changes and there's going to be two distinct models or styles of monarchy that we're going to discuss. First off, we're going to begin with England. And England is going to take uh, a little bit of a unique path uh, toward their modern version of monarchy. And that's going to be uh, complicated by the fact that England is going to have a very persistent series of conflicts that are going to revolve around religion, as well as politics, as well as cultural change. There's going to be a lot going on. So I'll try to streamline it for you as best I can. And we're going to start with James the first. James the first was the author of our reading for this week. Uh, he's also the successor, the person who came after Elizabeth the first of England. And that is itself uh, kind of exciting and significant because Elizabeth, if you recall, um, is the first and I believe only um, English monarch not only to rule as a woman, but never to marry. And because she doesn't marry, she doesn't have any direct successor. She doesn't have any children. And so, therefore, she had to choose someone. And the person she chose is her, I guess, second cousin, uh, James I. He's the son of Mary, Queen of Scots, if you remember her. She got executed. Um, and as a provision of making him her heir. He had to be raised from the time of childhood as a Protestant. That was one of the conditions. He had to agree to rule as a Protestant um, in England. And this is a little more complicated than you might think because James I comes from a family that is quite staunchly Catholic. Practically everybody is Catholic in his family except him. Uh, but he agreed that he would be Protestant in order to inherit both England and Scotland. He's got two uh, numbers after his name. He's James the First of England because he's the first guy named James to be King of England. He's James the Sixth of Scotland because there had been five King Jameses of Scotland before this. After his uh, inheriting of England, he really combines the two. And so England and Scotland had traditionally been two separate kingdoms and they're going to be ruled jointly by one person as a result of the fact that he inherits them both. Okay, so uh, he is, as I mentioned, a Protestant. And when he comes to the throne, he has some of the same problems that Elizabeth had and that her father Henry VIII had before her. Catholics are unhappy because he's Protestant. Protestants are unhappy, in many cases, because they feel he's not Protestant enough. And so James is going to go out of his way. He is by nature, as far as we know, uh, a relatively studious and serious man. And he's going to do quite a decent job of trying to continue uh, the policies of Elizabeth that were leading England to greater prosperity. He's going to expand their uh, mercantile empire. He's going to um, be engaged quite actively in um, expansion in the new world. And he's also going to go out of his way to sort of demonstrate to his supporters, the Protestants principally, uh, in England, that he is a bona fide, genuine Protestant. One of the ways he does that is by commissioning something called the King James Bible. If you've ever heard of it, he's the King James involved. And it was uh, meant to be a project that reassured Protestants, like most Protestant groups, and they do vary, but like most Protestant groups, um, James and the Anglicans, the Church of England, um, support the idea of translating the Bible into vernacular or local languages. The King James Bible project is, a, is in fact a translation project, but what makes it different uh, from earlier translations is that he commissions uh, the best scholars he can find, and there are quite a few of them, to uh, get hold of the earliest versions of each of the texts that make up the Bible. So the earliest versions of the Bible uh, are in Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek for the most part. And so rather than simply translating the Latin Bible, which was itself a translation of those Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek texts, and so therefore the book you end up with is a translation of a translation, um, he goes back to the originals and he hires the scholars who are experts in these languages 
to do a more direct translation from these oldest texts. And what they produce is quite poetic. It's very lovely. There have been many translations since that use the original text as well. Uh, but by doing this project, by commissioning it and paying for it, what he's attempting to do is demonstrate to his followers that he is a very serious Protestant dedicated to the kinds of things that are important to Protestants, like making uh, the Bible, the scripture, available to people to read in their own languages. He's also the author of our reading for this week, uh, The True Law of a Free Monarchy, in which he talks about the nature of monarchy. And what you may have noticed about James and that text is that he supports an idea called divine right. Uh, and this, in short, is the notion that a king is a king by the will of God, that God is the, the person who chooses and anoints kings, and so therefore, challenging a king's power, challenging his authority, uh, certainly rebelling against a king, is defying the will of God, and so therefore it shouldn't be done. Uh, he makes this argument relatively clearly uh, in his text, and he defends it uh, with scripture, among other things. Um, if you remember the true law of a free monarchy, he lays down three grounds upon which he's going to defend his point. Uh, the first is uh, the law of nature, um, and then he talks about how he's naturally a father to his subjects. It's a, a lovely idea. It's an old-fashioned idea that a king becomes the father of his uh, people. Um, and it's certainly a more sort of classic and traditional and uh, gentle and kind way of looking at it than we saw with, say, Cardinal Richelieu, who describes the common people as mules and, and nobles as no better than the common people. So it's a little kinder and gentler than that. But he also, and you may remember this from the reading this week, lays out a particular piece of the Bible to defend what it means to be king. And the, the, the selection he chooses is something out of the book of Samuel, which is a little odd. There are a lot of kings in the Bible, David, Solomon, very famous, very high profile ones. He has lots of choice if he wants to choose a passage from the Bible that talks about kingship. But instead, he chooses one where uh, one of the prophets of the Old Testament is uh, talking to the ancient Hebrews, people who don't have a king at this point, about what it will mean to have a king. Now, the reason they wanted a king was because their neighbors were beating them up in warfare and they wanted somebody who could rally support and uh, the troops and win wars. And the prophet, speaking, you know, with the insight and closeness to God, is going to give them a warning, Samuel says. He's like, look, here's the deal with a king. If you get a king, sure, you may win wars, but the deal is this. He's going to take your sons and he's going to put them in the army. He's going to take your daughters and he's going to make them his servants. He's going to take your stuff as taxes. He's going to take your land for his own use. He's going to boss you around. He's going to make you do things you, you don't want to do. You're not going to like it. You're going to complain. You're going to cry out to God because of the, the abuses the king is heaping on you, as you see it. And God will not hear you in that day. That's what James puts down. That's what he copies down out of the Bible. This is a, the notion of divine right, that the nature of kingship is approved by God. It's something people ask for. It's what they get. And if they don't like it, tough. That's the attitude. As evidence of some of the resistance uh, that James faced uh, from various parties as he came to the throne, there were several assassination attempts against him. The most famous of them was the gunpowder plot of uh, 1605, in which a group of Catholic conspirators, angry at the accession of yet another Protestant to the throne, decided that they could perhaps eliminate this uh, line of succession once and for all by blowing up the House of Parliament with the king inside it. Now, this is a little bit of a challenge because Parliament is only in session when the king calls it, and the king is only present on certain ceremonial days. He's there when he summons Parliament, he's there when he dismisses Parliament, and he's there for a few uh, ceremonial speeches, and that's basically it. The rest of the time, Parliament uh, convenes and holds its business on its own. And so the gunpowder plot was staged for a time when the king would be opening Parliament and present there. Uh, along with his greatest supporters, uh, Protestant nobles and Protestant uh, members of Parliament that are his great political support. 
So a group of uh, angry uh, radical Catholics decide that they are going to blow up Parliament. And in order to achieve this, they rent a, a cellar space underneath the House of Lords, which you could do at that time. And they pack it full of gunpowder, at least 36 barrels of gunpowder, which would have blown the place high, sky high. They pack it full of gunpowder and then they wait. And they had a longer wait than they anticipated because uh, there had been an outbreak of plague in London. And so uh, the opening of Parliament was moved from April to October. And so there was this long kind of delay in the meantime where the conspirators have to think about what they're going to do and how it's all going to go down. And during this delay, at least one of them has a bit of a crisis of conscience because not only are there Protestant members of Parliament, but there are Catholic members of Parliament as well. And so some of the conspirators, there were probably about 20 of them altogether, uh, become concerned and afraid that their Catholic patrons, their Catholic members of Parliament, will be blown up all right alongside the Protestants. And they don't want that to happen. And so one of them, we're not quite sure which one it was, uh, chickens out and sends a letter to a Lord Monteagle, who is uh, a baron and he is Catholic and is perceived to be a sympathizer. And in this letter, it basically says, uh, don't show up to Parliament on opening day. You probably don't want to. And by the way, if you could maybe tell some of the other Catholic lords not to show up either, that would be good. And in their minds, for whatever reason, they thought this would work. They thought that this noble would the baron would get this letter read it and be like oh okay then there's some kind of plot against parliament i guess i just won't show up that is not in fact what happens he takes it of course to the king and once the king has the letter in hand investigations are made the cellar is discovered the gunpowder is found a trap is laid and so soldiers wait to see who's going to show up and try to deal with the gunpowder and as they do this they apprehend uh, a few conspirators namely guy fox is the most famous of them um and then they're going to use him and get information to track down the rest um so it's very dramatic and there's all these sort of legendary stories about how when Guy Fawkes shows up and he sees the soldiers, he realizes that the game is up and people are on to him, but he still like runs with like a lit torch and he tries to light the gunpowder and blow up parliament, even though nobody's in it at the time, just to make his statement, but he's caught and wrestled to the ground and dragged back out. So he and his conspirators are going to be arrested. They're going to be uh, tried, uh, convicted, Guy Fox is going to end up hanged, drawn, and quartered. And since it happened in that order, then it, I guess it isn't as bad as otherwise. But um, nevertheless, he dies. But it does indicate a very important thing. Um, there really is a significant amount of political unrest that will, will boil into actual violence over religion as well as over politics. And James has this very narrow, difficult line to walk where he is trying to balance the influence of both factions. There are still a lot of Catholics in England. He can't get rid of them. He can't ban Catholicism at this point, though he is encouraging more and more people to adopt uh, the Church of England and Protestantism in order to have favored positions in his administration, etc. Nevertheless, these tensions and potential violence do kind of ride high. It's also, and this is just, I guess, for your information, Guy Fawkes Night, um, the gunpowder plot, um, is also known as Bonfire Night, and it is the um, the day that uh, the British celebrate their fireworks holiday. It's November 5th. They don't have an Independence Day the way that the United States has, because they don't have independence. They still have a monarchy. So in the United States, we have fireworks on the 4th of July. In uh, France, they have it on the 14th of July, which is Bastille Day, where they celebrate their independence from monarchy. But in England, they celebrate the day when Guy Fawkes failed to blow up Parliament. So that's just for your information. All right, so going onward, James is going to be successful. He is going to walk that line. He does have the temperament for it. He's a steady, uh, serious kind of a guy. And he is, even though he is sympathetic to Catholics and Catholicism, most of his family are Catholic, uh, he nevertheless remains Protestant and he remains Protestant enough to reassure his supporters. And so therefore he does manage to keep that balance. His successor, Charles, his son Charles, is going to have a little bit of a harder time. Charles is also going to be Protestant officially, 
um, although he does recant on his deathbed, but he's going to be Protestant officially, although he is even more sympathetic to the Catholic party um, in England than James was. So Parliament is a little bit uncertain about him. Charles is officially Protestant, but they're not really sure they can count on him. Parliament also is increasingly interested in trying to guarantee their ability to make executive decisions, their ability to make legislative decisions independent of the king, especially if they don't entirely trust that he's on their side. And so when Charles inherits, he inherits in 1625, but Parliament drags their feet on officially recognizing his ability and authority to rule and throwing their support behind them until he signs something called the Petition of Right. And in the Petition of Right, it's basically a charter or a legal contract in which it grants Parliament the exclusive right to levy new taxes or to create and institute new tax rules. And this is a major concession. It's a, a major thing to give over a source of authority, kind of a power of the purse, if you will. It's not complete and absolute. Charles is still allowed to uh, levy traditional taxes, the ones that are already on the books. He just can't come up with anything new, nothing surprising or different without getting Parliament's permission. So that's a big concession to Parliament. Charles was unhappy about having to make that concession. And so to retaliate for this, what he does is the minute that Parliament confirms him and throws their support behind him, he signs the petition of right, and then he dismisses Parliament. Parliament doesn't uh, convene at regular intervals at this point. They convene when the, the king summons them. Traditionally, the king summons them reasonably frequently. Uh, at least, you know, every year, the other year, something like that. Um, and they go back home when the king dismisses them. So the king dismisses them, sends them back home to their districts, and then just doesn't summon them again for 10 years. And this is a major political hot point. Uh, the members of parliament themselves, they're split into two camps. There's the House of Lords, and that's traditional, and you get to be a member of the House of Lords by inheriting uh, various titles around England. If you're a duke or a baron or uh, an earl or whatever, you're in the House of Lords. And then the other body, it's called the House of Commons. And to be in the House of Commons, you are elected. Now, this is not a free or democratic election at this point in England. Uh, the people who have a right to cast a vote are quite limited, uh, and it's mostly determined by uh, property, and a lot of it is still rolled up in those very same lords who occupy the House of Lords, so it's nothing like a democracy exactly. But the House of Commons is made up of people who don't have titles and are elected to their offices. And in the House of Commons, there is a very strong faction of not just Protestants, but radical Protestants, the Puritans we've talked about in the past, people who really want to see uh, Charles, James before him, uh, Elizabeth before that, move toward a much stricter, uh, more, uh, I guess, morally upright in their view, uh, demeanor and behavior on the part of the king, of the aristocracy, and the government in general. They would like to see more favorable rules made uh, for Puritans, uh, they themselves, to celebrate uh, their religion, to generally promote their ideals. And so you have this uh, segment of Parliament that is uh, dominated, I guess you could say, by these sort of religious zealots, um, reformers, who would like to see their agenda promoted um, equally at least alongside that of the king. And in ideal terms, they'd like to see it promoted over and above um, the agenda of certainly Catholics and even more moderate Protestants. And Charles hates them. He doesn't want them to have more support. He really wants, if there's going to be Protestantism, it to be the more softer, gentler kind of Anglican Protestantism that James supported and that Elizabeth supported before that. He also is quite sympathetic to Catholics, and he doesn't want to see them uh, ruled as ineligible to serve in government, for instance. And so Charles finds himself at odds uh, with this Puritan faction. So he simply refuses to call Parliament for 10 years. And during those 10 years, 
The radicals in Parliament are only growing more radical. They're getting angrier and angrier. They are stewing over this and they're making a list of all the things Charles is doing uh, while they're not being summoned that they don't like. And that list includes he's been appointing bishops to various important jobs and positions around England and the people he chooses are like-minded people who are moderate people who'd like to see Protestantism sort of light where most of the doctrine agrees with Catholicism but they have translated Bibles and married clergy and and various uh, general social softening but for the most part it looks kind of like Catholicism um, and they're generally open and tolerant of other Protestant sects as well he, they're also angry because he circumvents that whole petition of right thing by simply not calling for new taxes. But when he needs more money, instead of coming up with a new tax, he simply raises the rates on existing taxes and says that's not the same thing. They're mad about that. Um, and so he's making political appointments, he's making religious appointments, he's uh, managing to get his tax revenue uh, by going using this loophole to get around the petition of right. They're getting angrier and angrier and angrier. And by not summoning parliament, uh, they feel very offended. And there's a lot of people who might have been religiously very much not interested in the conflict. They're middle ground people. But the longer Charles goes without summoning parliament, the more those people begin to be uneasy. The tradition of having Parliament as a, an ancillary check, uh, something that's again that will counterbalance the exclusive power of the king, is something that was long traditional in England, and it was something that they held up culturally as uh, evidence that they didn't have tyranny, that they had something like, inspired by the Magna Carta, uh, a bit of shared power that they had um, a government that was not simply an absolutist monarchy or a dictatorship, but instead was one that had sort of traditional respect for common law and traditional respect for people outside the king himself. And so by not summoning parliament, Charles is playing with fire here. He's angering people who might not have been uh, his political adversary to begin with, but they're starting to become convinced that way now. Then, Charles issues uh, something called the Book of Common Prayer. This is once again an attempt to create unity and an attempt to create agreement inside the Church of England. Unfortunately, the political reality and the religious and social reality just is not going to let that happen. The Book of Common Prayer was meant to be a compilation of prayers, it makes sense, uh, but it's meant to be a compilation of religious texts and prayers that will uh, put out what officially the Church of England believes and define it so that if you're outside the Book of Common Prayer, if it's not in there, then it's not approved. And that style of worship and those kinds of texts that you might be uh, using if you were, say, in a Puritan uh, religious institution would not be allowed anymore. And so it will end up being a more restricted view of what uh, Anglicanism is of what the official Church of England is and what officially Protestants in England are supposed to believe. Well, Puritans, some of them in Scotland and uh, some of them in England itself, are going to freak out at the Book of Common Prayer. They're not going to be dictated to in this way. They feel it flies in the face of all of their freedom of conscience and uh, the traditions established by Elizabeth on down of not interfering too much in people's religious lives. And so there is a great deal of resistance to it. It's going to spark a rebellion. Now this was brewing for political reasons as well. Scotland and England had been joined by James I into one single kingdom because you've had one person inherit them both. They're not really 100% comfortable with that in Scotland. Scotland had been its own separate kingdom for centuries at this point, and they're not 100% sure, many of the lords in Scotland, that they're really cool with getting rolled into uh, English politics. And so this is a good excuse, this Book of Common Prayer, to uh, push back and there's going to be a major rebellion in Scotland. It's going to be followed almost immediately by a rebellion in Ireland as well. In Ireland, they're Catholic, but they have some of the same reservations about being ruled uh, by uh, sort of an increasingly narrow, uh, religiously speaking at least, vision 
of monarchy and so they too would like to have some more independence the more self-determination and so it's both political and religious but both scotland and ireland are going to go into rebellion this is a problem for charles because charles needs to raise an army in order to suppress the rebellion of scotland and the rebellion of ireland the problem with raising an army is that armies cost money. This is not an era where there's just a huge standing army just ready to roll at any time. He has to come up with emergency funds in order to pay for the suppression of the Scottish rebellion and then the suppression of the Irish rebellion. The problem is that in order to come up with emergency funds, he's going to have to levy new taxes. And in order to levy new taxes, he needs the approval of Parliament. And in order to get the approval of Parliament, he has to summon Parliament. And they've been waiting for this. It's been 10 years. They've got a list. They're angry. And so he summons Parliament. And when they arrive, they immediately convene in their chamber and they begin laying out a series of demands for the king that they've been waiting just for this opportunity to lay out. And the demands are not modest. They basically want every clergy person, every bishop that's been appointed by the king in the last 10 years deposed, removed from office and replaced with someone they find more uh, acceptable. They want a lot of the, the programs and laws of the king that have been laid out over the last 10 years all reversed. Basically everything Charles has done for 10 years, they want undone. So they lay out these demands. Charles gets wind of it and he's like, oh man, no way. No way am I doing this. This is, I've been working on this for 10 years trying to get England the way I want it. And now they're going to try to undo everything and they're going to boss me. Uh, no, 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 forget it. So he has to come up with a way to try to prevent this because he needs the funds. He needs the army and they're not going to approve it unless he gives them all these concessions. And so he's like, okay, here's the plan. Comes up with a brilliant plan. Brace yourself. His brilliant plan is... He's going to identify who the ringleaders are, the serious radicals in Parliament who are whipping everybody up, and he's going to arrest them and get them out of the way. And then when they're not there, Parliament will have a vote. And because they aren't there to whip people up, he figures it's more likely to go his way. That was the plan. It's not the first time a monarch in England has tried this. Uh, and it's worked in the past. It doesn't work this time because apparently no one in England can keep a secret. So his plan to arrest the, the ringleaders in Parliament is leaked. They find out about it and they go straight to the House of Parliament itself and barricade themselves inside. They send out uh, letters and messengers to uh, get supporters to rally to them in Parliament, letting them know what the king's plan was and uh, preparing to resist. Now, this is where it turns into something like an I Love Lucy episode, where it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. A sensible person would, at this point, simply have denied everything. Charles could totally have gotten out of this. He'd been like, I don't know what you're talking about. You've got poor intelligence from somewhere. I never intended to do any such thing. But no, what he does is he hears that uh, the members of Parliament have barricaded themselves inside the Houses of Parliament, and he decides that he's going to send soldiers to dig them out of there. So he sends troops and Parliament, if you've ever been to London, is right in the middle of London. This is not something you can miss. If you know the Tower of Big Ben, it's right there. It's part of the House of Parliament. Um, and so uh, this is not something he can do quietly. The members of Parliament, duly elected by the people, have been uh, barricaded inside. And now the king is sending soldiers to attack the legislative body itself. This looks terrible. I mean, the PR on this is awful. Everybody knows about it. Everybody sees it. And what they see is a tyrant attacking the uh, duly elected members of the uh, British government. And so this is where it gets even worse. Charles sends the soldiers to go dig these members of parliament out and they fail because they've been barricaded in, because they have weapons with them, the members of Parliament fight off the king's attempts to arrest them and retain control of the House of Parliament. And all of these messages go out to all of their political supporters across the country. And 
Uh, those supporters draw on all their political connections and the parliament that's still inside the house is going to pass legislation that basically declares the king's actions illegal, summons the army to their defense, and what happens is the English Civil War. So, all right, now, once Parliament has decided that they're going to break with the king, and this really is what happens, uh, they summon all of their supporters, as I mentioned before. Uh, the leaders of those who are breaking with the king come to be known as the Roundheads. They're called that because many of them are Puritan. And Puritans will, uh, I guess, announce their religious views and their general social views by turning their nose up and eschewing um, all of the sort of elaborate fashions that were being followed by other people of the 17th century. And in the 17th century, it was fashionable to not only have elegant clothes made out of wonderful rich fabrics and uh, kind of puffy sleeves and all that kind of jazz, but also to wear your hair long and flowing, whether you're a man or a woman, woman it would be tied up, but um, the roundheads were known as roundheads because they had a habit of cutting their hair quite short uh, because they didn't believe in the sort of vanity of having long flowing hair. And so on the opposite side, you had the royal supporters known as the cavaliers, which is just a fancy French based word for um, a knight, somebody who rides a horse. Um, and so the two sides are going to form. Charles has his supporters, and on the other side you have these parliamentarians, uh, many of whom are spearheaded and led by serious religious reformers, Puritans who want to see a religious change in England as well as a political change. And that is the two things that are kind of united together. The Roundheads are looking for two main goals. They would like to see more uh, Puritan style of religious leadership in England, but also they would like to see a political structure where Parliament is empowered compared to the king, where Parliament has more ability to make choices and decisions and influence government than the king has on his own. And part of the reason they want that, it's not as much a, a philosophical thing as it is they see this as necessary to secure good moral leadership, that kings have a tendency to be corrupt, that they have a tendency to be decadent, and they have a tendency to be very Catholic sympathizing. And so all of those things uh, are suspicious to the Puritan sort of hardcore faction, and they would like to see change made. So, as I mentioned, uh, it breaks into open conflict and civil war. This is just referred to as the English Civil War. Uh, the leader, uh, we'll get to him in just a bit, talk about him in more detail, of the roundhead side, he rises through the ranks of the army, is a commander by the name of Oliver Cromwell. And as they take the field, Cromwell's uh, strategy and defense is going to be successful. And he has the support of enough of the English army. It fractures. It is a civil war. Uh, so it's English versus English person. Um, and the, the roundheads, the Puritans, have enough uh, support and pull inside the army that they're going to be successful. They're going to, going to win a series of battles culminating with the Battle of Naseby in 1645. And in this battle, Charles is going to be captured and he's going to be dragged back to London and put into prison. Once this happens, Charles is going to be put on trial. And this is really an unprecedented uh, step in terms of the history of monarchy. Charles is going to be tried for treason against England, treason against the state, even though he is the king. And even though there really is not much legal precedent for saying that the king is limited really in any way, uh, that he really, the king's actions are typically and traditionally considered to be um, legal, that whatever he does, even if it's a terrible abuse, is nevertheless uh, the action of the government. And so therefore the idea of a king being tried for treason is itself a really radical and, and new idea. But this is the, the theory that is tested at this time. Cromwell puts forward the idea that England and England's government is something separate and apart from the king and his leadership. That there is a law that supersedes uh, the decisions of the king, and that law is superior to everything, even the monarchy. He is going to be tried, as I mentioned, he's going to be convicted, and there'll be a fierce debate over what to do with him. Now that he's been convicted of treason, is it enough simply to remove him from power, or what should they do? 
Cromwell is going to be among those who are going to advocate for the king's execution. The idea being that uh, if he's convicted of treason, they should get rid of him, number one. And number two, that as long as he's alive, there's going to be a faction that will stir up trouble and cause minor rebellions and try to put him back on the throne. And so they, the decision is made and he's going to be executed. His son is going to manage to escape from England. Uh, there's a near miss, as it were. He attempts to take the throne back. He fails. He has to leave and he goes into exile. He's going to spend most of it in France uh, for the next many years. So who does that leave? This guy. Oliver Cromwell uh, came to prominence as a military commander, comes through the ranks of the, the army in England. And he is very successful and distinguished at it. He is uh, he has some political background as well. He is a very serious Puritan. He is somebody who is Calvinist. He is somebody who wants to see a more religiously upright leadership as he sees it. And he comes to power. He'll be named Lord Protector will be his official title. And he's going to rule effectively as a military dictator during the time that he establishes the Protectorate. Mm -hmm. Uh, he doesn't call himself a king, although he rules effectively as a king. He, ex he exercises executive power, he controls the army, and this is a great deal of the support uh, that he is going to rely on, as he has a lot of support inside the army. And he more or less directs England much the way that, it, that a king would. He is going to be different from Charles, certainly, uh, the, king, the former king of England, in that he is a Puritan. He also is going to be in charge of suppressing those rebellions. It started under Charles. There was a rebellion of Scotland. That's no longer, well, it's going to be suppressed relatively rapidly under Cromwell. And there's a rebellion in Ireland that has been raging since as well. Cromwell pulls together a big army and he's going to send it over to Ireland and he's going to begin a campaign there. He was uh, brutal in Scotland, but in Ireland, uh, Cromwell and his troops kind of hit a new low. Cromwell is driven in this by the fact that in Ireland, uh, people are overwhelmingly Catholic. It is strongly Catholic. More than uh, 80 to 90 percent of people in Ireland at the time he invades are Catholic. Cromwell doesn't approve of that. Um, and he certainly doesn't approve of rebellion. And so he unleashes his soldiers in a series of really brutal battles where people are massacred, not just soldiers, but civilians as well. Uh, then, uh, once he has secured Ireland, and some of this he does himself, some of it he leaves in the hands of deputy generals. And as he goes back to England to solve problems there, um, once Ireland is secured, Cromwell is going to pursue a series of policies that are meant to both punish uh, Ireland for rebellion and suppress Catholicism, which is the great majority of people's religion in Ireland. So he closes the Catholic churches. There's no public uh, celebration of Catholicism in Ireland allowed at all after this. He bars any Catholic from occupying any sort of public office. He's going to uh, institute a policy of mandatory schooling for children uh, and also institute the policy that not only all government business but all educational business will be conducted in English only and so uh, Irish language uh, Gaelic will be totally banned in Ireland which is quite a step. Um, he also is going to cause the forced relocation of people. He seizes Catholicly owned lands and remember Catholicism is the great majority religion so Land in Ireland is mostly owned by Catholic before Cromwell's invasion. After Cromwell's invasion, that is not the case. He's going to seize land. He's going to move people, particularly in Northern Ireland, away from their valuable farmland into less valuable land in the province of Connaught. And uh, the sort of, there's a, I don't know what you want to call it. There's a saying, an aphorism, that um, Cromwell gave people the choice they could move to hell or to Connaught. That's your choice. And so thousands of people, tens of thousands of people are going to be displaced, moved from their homes, moved into places where they're going to live as tenants. Even if they get to stay where they lived originally, land is seized and is no longer going to be owned by Catholic residents, but instead is going to be given out as bounty, as reward for his supporters and his followers. And so those brutal generals that were slaughtering their way through civilian populations are going to be given uh, big swaths of Ireland to own and control. 
Also in England, people who are doing favors for Cromwell will be given big chunks of land in Ireland as a way to reward them. This is going to be very important for Irish history, uh, really until today, uh, because the people who are given this land are going to be very often absentee landlords. They own land in Ireland. They want to turn a profit off that land, but not many of them are actually going to move to Ireland and be resident there. That will be important later, so just kind of know that piece of information. So the Irish population is going to be absolutely brutalized by Cromwell, and as a result, even today, Oliver Cromwell is, is kind of a bad word in Ireland, a very bad word, um, and so he gets that reputation. He's terribly intolerant in terms of religion. He's uh, terribly brutal in terms of trying to force people's compliance. In England, it's not even a heck of a lot better. Um, he certainly doesn't slaughter people, certainly not civilians, in the same way. He doesn't force everyone to become a Puritan in England, uh, but he does, however, exercise a very serious restriction on the presses. Anything Cromwell perceives as uh, immoral gets shut down. The theater, for instance, and this is the land of Shakespeare, supported by Elizabeth and James, um, and the theater is going to be closed because this is not considered something appropriate for people to be doing. Uh, he's also going to put really strict censors on the presses, and he, those censors are going to uh, act not just in political ways, so as to stop any um, criticism of the government, his government in particular, but also the censors are going to work on a moral uh, level as well from his perspective, so that things like novels, which are a brand new genre at this point, things like plays, anything that seems too racy or salacious or um, frivolous are going to be banned and they're not going to be allowed to be published. There's really serious restrictions put on that. And this is not, as you might imagine, particularly popular. He represents a faction of radical uh, Protestants known as Puritans, but most people in England are not part of that faction. And being ruled by Puritans turns out to be something of a drag uh, for many of the people in their perspective in England. There are people who are royalists who are displaced. They've gone into exile in some cases. There are people who are just kind of moderates who really don't like this style of governance. There are people who are disenchanted even in among the sort of radical supporters of uh, Protestantism even among the radical uh, Puritans because Cromwell is ruling effectively like a king and so there's a lot of unhappiness uh, I guess you could say in Cromwell's England and even though he accomplishes at least some of his goals in terms of uh, I guess solidifying uh, his rule and calming things down and trying to repair the economy after the English Civil War Cromwell is still going to be a really divisive figure and people are not, he's not universally loved, we'll just say that. So when he dies, when Cromwell is out of it, um, there's going to be some political disarray. He ruled more or less like a king, but he did not uh, draw on the idea of inherited, I guess, government, that once he died, it wasn't really supposed to create a new dynasty. And so once uh, Cromwell dies, there is a great deal of debate over what will happen now. And uh, various factions are at each other's throats. It's just chaotic. There's more fighting. There's all kinds of disarray. And in the end, Parliament decides that this whole experiment with the Lord Protector and having Puritans rule England was really not all that successful, and that maybe the pathway back towards stability and growth and uh, peace would be to ask the king to come back. And so they restore the monarchy. In 1660, Parliament requests that the son of, James, of Charles I, the guy who gets beheaded, should come back and become the king out of exile. And so he agrees, and he does. And as you can see from his outfit, he is not a Puritan or anybody who sympathizes with them. He's got a beautiful ermine cape there. Um, and he's going to return. He's going to be known as the Merry Monarch, Charles II. And this period is known as the Restoration. And it will be known as this almost like Roaring Twenties kind of party time. Because Charles II, when he comes back to the throne, he undoes a lot of those restrictions that really people were upset about under Cromwell. 
So he reopens the presses and allows them to practice with very, very limited censorship. It's not completely gone, but it's really extremely limited. So that the presses in England become among the most free of anywhere in Europe. And so if you have radical political ideas or religious ideas, England becomes the place where you go to have those ideas published and promoted. He reopens the theaters. He reduces the restrictions on like bars and taverns that Crom Cromwell had done that too, uh, that Cromwell had put in place. He is known as the Merry Monarch in part because he himself has a reputation for being something of a party guy. Um, he enjoys having parties. He also becomes famous and sort of beloved in some circles. He has his enemies, don't get me wrong, but he becomes famous and beloved in some circles because he um, loves to travel incognito around England. He'll dress as a common person and just kind of blend in. And he sort of becomes infamous for doing this, of being just, you never know when the king might just turn up and be having a beer somewhere. Anyway, um, he does that. He also, uh, one of his detractors made a joke about him that he could be considered the father of his country in a bit too literal way. He very famously has mistresses. He acknowledges at least a dozen illegitimate children. He is just a fun-loving kind of guy, but it has its downsides. Uh, they, he definitely courts criticism from the Puritans that are not gone. He also, even though he has at least 12 uh, illegitimate children that he acknowledges, he doesn't have a legitimate heir, and that's a problem. Charles is officially a Protestant. That was part of the uh, deal that Parliament made with him. They make a series of other deals as well. Before they let him come back, they don't allow Charles II to have the same amount of power even Charles I had. Not only does he have to sign something called the Petition of Right, but it goes beyond that. He has to get Parliament's approval for a whole series of legislative moves. He has to surrender a good deal of what the king has done independently by tradition into the hands of Parliament. And so he begins a process where the king is really beginning to share power. He still is a powerful figure at this stage, but it's, it's starting down that slope. At any rate, he has at least 12, as I mentioned, illegitimate children, but he does not have a legitimate heir. And even though he is Protestant, that was a condition of him being the king, his family, if you recall, is all really Catholic. They're Catholic up one side and down another. And so this makes Parliament a little bit edgy. They're afraid that he's going to be a little bit too sympathetic to Catholics. And Charles really doesn't do much to dispel this um, at fear. He is quite an open-minded, I guess you could say, religiously speaking, and tolerant figure. He doesn't really seek to have any kind of uh, persecution of any religious figures at all. He just lets people do what they want to do. And this is good for some, and others find it unnerving. They're a little afraid that he's a little bit too sympathetic to the Catholics. When he dies, he doesn't have an heir. He doesn't have someone to come after him. And the next person in line is his brother, James II. James II is, as I just mentioned, Catholic. And so when he comes to the throne as a Catholic, Parliament is really, really not sure they want this to happen. They're afraid that the Civil War is going to break out again. They're afraid things are going to go badly. They're not sure that this is at all what they want. They're very, they wanted a Protestant, but do they want to force him to be Protestant? They're not sure. And so they dither for a little bit. A couple years after he takes the throne, he passes something called the Declaration of Indulgence. And in the Declaration of Indulgence, James II basically says, it's okay if you want to be Catholic. All of the legal restrictions that have put, been put on Catholics in government positions uh, that go back for the generation or two before him, um, those are going to be lifted. Anybody who wants to be Catholic, it is now okay to be Catholic. And so therefore, um, we're going to kind of open that door. And Protestants in Parliament freak out. They're like, oh no, we're going to have another war. It's going to open the people. The factions are going to be at each other's throats again. This is going to be awful. We have to do something. And so they take action. And here we have it, the culmination of this path that England's been on. In 1688, Parliament simply tells James II that he's not the king anymore. Instead, they invite 
uh, James's daughter, there she is, Mary, um, to come to England and rule as queen alongside her husband, William of Orange. And the person they really wanted in all this was William of Orange. That's who they really wanted to be the next, uh, I guess, ruler of England. Uh, but he, you know, he doesn't have any legitimate, uh, I guess, hereditary claim to the throne, whereas Mary does. And so what they do, and it's the only time this happens in English history, they offer them the, the opportunity to be joint monarchs. So they rule as king and queen, not as queen and uh, prince consort or king and, you know, queen, but she's not in charge. So they are going to rule jointly uh, with the support of parliament and with the acknowledgement and understanding that parliament will have a growing uh, role in terms of actually governing and legislating in England. And it works. Parliament declares them to be the king and queen. They declare James II not to be the king. And it's called the Glorious Revolution because it is all but bloodless. There's almost no fighting. Uh, James II is deposed and he ends up having to flee the country. He goes to France and he makes a couple of like weak attempts to try to take the throne back. It doesn't really work. Um, and William and Mary take the throne and rule as joint monarchs without having to fight a bloody revolution over it. That's why it's called the Glorious Revolution. And this demonstrates exactly how far uh, British monarchy has come. It's gone from James I with his divine right and however a king is, you just have to suck it up and deal all the way down to the Glorious Revolution, where Parliament simply has the power to make or break the king. They can simply say to James II, you're not king, these people are, that's how it is, deal. So truly, we've moved toward constitutional monarchy. The idea of monarchy that is defined and limited by legal text, the Constitution of England. Um, well, it's not really a constitution, it's not formal, it's a collection of English common law, that's a separate thing. They don't have a, a straight, you know, constitution in the way that the United States does. Uh, but it's known as constitutional monarchy because it is something that is limited. It's something where the law and parliament and the legislative body has control uh, alongside the king. On the flip side of that, what we have is a completely different model of monarchy, also equally modern, uh, that we find in France. France is going to follow a completely, as I mentioned, different path. Where England moves toward limited monarchy and constitutional monarchy, France is going to move toward absolute monarchy. And the poster child for absolute monarchy is going to be this guy, Louis XIV. Louis XIV is known as the Sun King. He's going to be the king from 1643 to 1715. He's the longest reigning Euro European monarch. So in all of Europe, he is going to be king the longest, 72 years. And when you find uh, kings and queens that rule for long periods of time like that, very often they end up being politically significant because the changes they put in place have the advantage of being defended for a long period of time, so long that people forget that there are other ways of doing things. And so that is going to be a big part of where Louis XIV's success comes in. He's going to be a king for a long time, and he has a long time to get his policies in place. We'll return to l'état c'est moi in just a minute, but that's just a, a phrase that is associated with him. He probably never actually said it but we'll talk about why it's associated with him. We'll circle back. Okay. Okay. So, in case you're wondering, I guess I should mention it. L'état c'est moi means I am the state is one way to translate that. It's a reference to, I guess, a logical conclusion. We talked about Machiavelli weeks ago. And in Machiavelli, his famous quote is, the ends justify the means. And then, a week or so before we went away, um, we talked about Cardinal Richelieu. And Cardinal Richelieu, who supported the idea of absolute monarchy for Louis XIII, Louis XIV's dad, um, he uh, was famous for the phrase raison d'etat, or reason of state. And that, in a sense, follows up on Machiavelli. Machiavelli says the ends justify the means. Richelieu says that the needs of the state justify anything you want to do. That's Those are the ends that justify the means. 
The famous quote that is probably a misquote that probably he never said, but is associated with Louis XIV, is I am the state. So if you follow that logical circle, if uh, the state justifies any action and the king is equivalent to the state, what Louis XIV would be saying there if he'd ever actually said this is that my needs, my advantage, my uh, benefit justifies any action. The king and the state are the same thing. The king and the government, the king and France, in a sense, are the same thing. So how do we get to that point? Well, we'll start at the beginning. Part of the reason he rules for 72 years is that when he comes to the throne, he is a five-year-old, he's a, or six. He's a child, quite young, and things were in disarray in 1643. The Thirty Years' War is still raging. France is involved in that. There's uh, crop shortages. There's food prices are soaring. There's disruption. The army is launched in various uh, theaters in Europe. There's all this fighting. The king, Louis XIII, dies is relatively young and unexpectedly and the new boy king Louis XIV is going to be uh, in put in charge of his well sorry I'll go back there okay as I was saying he was going to be put in the charge of his mother Anne of Austria who's going to rule as regent uh, she is the daughter of the Holy Roman Emperor. She's a very powerful figure in her own right. And she is scrambling at the time uh, that Louis XIV takes the throne to try to keep France in one piece. And it's not easy. She has an advisor, Cardinal Mazarin, who is going to be very much in the same stamp as Cardinal Richelieu, who's dead at this point. Um, he's going to follow the same kinds of very mercenary, very ruthless policies to improve and increase the power of the king. Um, and also the Queen Regent, who's in charge at this point. Anne of Austria um, is an absolutely tough cookie and a powerful figure in her own right. But things are desperate in these early years. As I mentioned, there's an uh, economic crisis. The, there's a war going on. Things are just in disarray. The king is very young, too young to active, af actively, effectively rule. And rumors begin circulating like crazy. Um, at the time, there's also huge cash flow issues. Anne of Austria famously at one point had to sell her jewelry in order to uh, keep paying the staff at the palace so that they could keep eating and keep the lights on candles and so forth um, in the palace things were a desperate in a desperate situation and rumors begin circulating all through Paris uh, as more taxes are levied to try to make up for um, the, the general crop failures, the high prices, all the kinds of problems that are going badly. Uh, people are petitioning for relief and not getting it. And so all these rumors begin circulating that the young king, the boy king, is being taken advantage of, that he's being uh, imprisoned somewhere and, and uh, is being treated badly, that he's secretly dead. And Anne of Austria and Cardinal Mazarin are plotting to conceal it from the world so they don't have to give over the reins of power to somebody else. So all of these things are circulating. At the same time, at the same time, there's a lot of unrest in the city of Paris in particular. This is a theme that we're going to come back to in our next lecture as well. Paris is particularly vulnerable when food prices soar, when things get bad. Paris is in trouble because it's a large city and they don't have the capacity to grow enough food in the immediate surrounding area around Paris to feed the people of Paris, which means that foodstuffs have to be imported and brought into the city. So anytime, like with the Thirty Years' War, you have trade networks disrupted, anytime you have crop failures and shortages, it's going to hit Paris early and it's going to hit them hard and prices go up. A lot of poor working class people live in Paris. They can't find enough money for food. They become very angry. They riot in the streets and they express their displeasure toward the royal family. There's also an outbreak, which is not surprising at all, of various contagious diseases. There's another small upsurge, we talked about this with England as well, of plague. Uh, there's going to be uh, major uh, upsurges in other types of contagious diseases as well. Influenza, cholera, typhus, scarlet fever, all of those things uh, are going to sweep across Europe. Not just the, the direct battlefield um, diseases that we find, dysentery and various other people who are dying by the 
thousands day after day in the Thirty Years' War, there are just massive uh, epidemics of disease that are sweeping across Europe from one side to another. As people go hungry, they're more vulnerable. Um, as people are moving in large groups with the, the war, they're more vulnerable. The cost of the war is astronomical. Things are really just rocky and difficult uh, while Louis XIV is a kid. And he's going to live through this with uh, really quite a lot of trauma attached. At one point, while he's still very young, the Fronde, which is the name that is given for the, the rioting working class people in, in Paris, are going to get to a point where the rumors that the king is dead, the boy king has been killed and is not really alive anymore, and it's just the evil cardinal and the queen that are running things, they become so convinced of these rumors that they break into the palace, they overwhelm the guards, push their way in, break through the doors, run up into the king's bedroom, where he's just a little boy sleeping in a little bed, and uh, burst through the doors and look at him. And so this angry crowd of armed rabble comes busting into the palace, breaks into his bedroom, look at him, and they're like, oh, there he is. <laughs> Sleep on the bed. Then they turn around and they leave. Nothing bad happened to him, but at the same time, imagine psychologically what that does to you as a child. He was terrified by it. And as an adult, he's going to spend a lot of his life trying to figure out how to make sure that kind of thing doesn't happen to him ever again. Later in his uh, youth, while well, he's an adolescent, he has, as her picture is down there on the left, an unsuitable girlfriend as well, Cardinal Mazarin's niece, I think, uh, Marie Mancini, um, whom he is desperately in love with, but his mother doesn't approve of, and she has to break them up, and it's all very dramatic. So Louis XIV has a really dramatic and in many ways traumatic childhood, where he has all of these problems, and France is in a bit of disarray, but it starts to even out uh, by the time time he's 18 or so and able to actually take over the throne the 30 years war is over france was not the region that was most heavily hit uh, that's going to be central europe the holy roman empire and what happens afterwards uh, it's not really the holy roman empire anymore a lot of it uh, but they're really torn up france is less seriously affected they're in a good position to rebuild um, they, because there hasn't been a lot of physical damage, they're now in a good position to plant and be uh, get good prices for their crops. Uh, they're in a good spot. And so while Louis XIV is growing up, things start to look up for France. They start to become more prosperous. Things start to look more stable, politically speaking, and things are going well. Okay, so Louis comes of age. Uh, he had to give up his, uh, his uh, I guess, unsuitable girlfriend. And in 1651, he marries a cousin, Maria Teresa of Spain. Uh, everybody's marrying their cousins at this point. Uh, but uh, not everybody, but only in the royal family, I suppose I should say. <laughs> at any rate, he marries Maria Teresa of Spain, which is a, a good alliance. It brings a, an infusion of cash, and he manages to uh, make a whole bunch of political headway as well because of this marriage. Uh, he's going to reform his tax code to make it more, I guess you could say, scientific. Yeah, up until this point, and this is something that Louis is going to struggle with throughout his reign, uh, but he is going to take it on. Up until this point, tax collection in France, a lot of it went all the way back to the Middle Ages. So you had traditional tax rates that varied from one farm to the next. You had local nobles who were in charge of collecting it that might be doing a good job and might not be. It was all sort of scattered. There was no kind of consistency across the board. Louis is going to reform that. He's going to make the rates more consistent. He's going to make it more clear who has to pay taxes and who doesn't. The nobles are still exempt, but by the skin of their teeth at this point. Uh, he's going to take away also a lot of the sort of traditional local family officials who are in charge of, say, collecting tolls on bridges or uh, being in charge of the... Um, I, I, you know, pick a, a governmental job. People who are in charge of, I don't know, certifying herds of cattle, that kind of thing. He's going to take those jobs away from local officials, and he's going to hire and promote a whole, like, army of professional bureaucrats. He really is going to try to modernize the government in France, so that instead of being done by local people who may or may not know what they're doing, Instead, professionals are going to be sent out to actually do those jobs in a way that's consistent with the way the king wants them done. 
Most famously, he applies this in the, in, uh, the case of courts. Again, traditionally, and it goes back to the Middle Ages and beyond, uh, the local courts, law courts, were presided over by local nobles and whoever the local nobles might have appointed to act as their deputies. Louis is going to try to counteract that by making it official policy that these local magistrate courts should be presided over by people with official legal training, actual trained lawyers and jurists who know what they're doing and understand the law. And so he's going to try to make these types of changes right across France. And the goal of all of them is to make it more efficient for the king to collect tax revenue and also more efficient for the king to have his laws and wishes uh, carried out effectively and immediately in the country. He's trying to centralize authority so that the king by himself is going to be the one making the important decisions in France. He's going to also expand the army. He's going to modernize it with its uh, weapons, he's also going to modernize it with strategy, and he's going to modernize the size of the army, and that is always a march toward bigger and bigger, more standing army, more people hanging around. He's going to pay for all of this, in large part, uh, through the efforts of his finance minister, Jean-Baptiste Colbert, that's him there on the right. Um, he is appointed finance minister in 1665, and he pursues a policy known as mercantilism. Mercantilism is the uh, idea that um, the best policy for a government to pursue is one where they take an active role in manipulating the national economy. And so that means that they're going to manipulate tariffs and tax rates in order to encourage industry and importation and exportation at a favorable rate. It means that they are going to invest very heavily and very directly in industry, sometimes in shipping and manufacturing. So the, the king of France is going to pay for new and updated and more modernized merchant fleets, for instance. He's going to pay for new and updated and more modernized ports and uh, kind of loading docks in order to make um, trade more profitable. Uh, in some cases, he's going to pay for uh, workshops. This is a little early for factories per se, but the King of France is going to start paying for uh, professional workshops to produce uh, luxury goods in large part because they'll sell for high prices, but any kind of manufactured goods that can be sold for a profit. Uh, this is going to go to quite extreme lengths. For instance, in other parts of Europe where they had a uh, very famous successful industry, Murano, for instance, in Italy, where they produce beautiful colored glass. Um, and in Brussels, where they produced fantastically beautiful lace. These industries were perceived by the King of France and Colbert as something that France should be pursuing on their own. And so in order to do that, uh, they'd send uh, ambassadors basically to the artisans in Murano and the artisans in Brussels and say, hey, you produce beautiful stuff here. Uh, I see that you have this lovely workshop. What do you say? Have you ever thought about moving to France? We'll build you anything you want. You'll have the most beautiful, up-to-date, modernized workshop that you could possibly want. We'll give you access to all of the workers that you could possibly want to have. We'll pay you top dollar. All we want is for you to move yourself and your expertise into France and work for us. So they literally go around poaching uh, artisans and experts from around the rest of Europe in order to create those industries in France as well. They also are going to invest heavily in colonial expansion. They're going to put more money into expanding uh, French mercantile interests in North America as well as in the Caribbean. Um, and they are going to do the best they can to bring in things like timber and fur and sell them at a, at a profit and expand colonial territory and generally uh, just try to make lots of money. And what does he do with this money? Well, part of what he does are all the things we've already mentioned, very practical applications. Reforming the tax code and trading professional lawyers is not exactly cheap after all. Uh, but he's also going to spend money on creating a new court culture. Uh, Louis is moving all of his goals into line, and all of them line up to try to create this absolute monarchy, a kingdom where the king is the one effectively controlling and making decisions about as many aspects of government as are possible to control 
by one person. That is the goal. And it is a very modern notion of monarchy. This is not what monarchy looked like in the Middle Ages. But it is something that Louis XIV is moving toward. And to that end, he's going to invest in building, or rather rebuilding, a palace uh, on an old hunting ground property outside Paris known as Versailles. Versailles, as I mentioned, is outside the city of Paris itself, and there's a reason that Louis wants to move his palace to this place. First, it has to do purely with security. He grew up, if you remember, uh, afraid of the mob in Paris. He doesn't like kind of being at the mercy of uh, local workers and, and rioters that could possibly cause disruption at any time. And by moving outside the city, he's creating a buffer zone, a kind of a safety release so that anybody who's mad in Paris would have to hike their way over to Versailles over miles and miles. And by the time they get there, they can be intercepted by the army. So partly it's just security. And partly at Versailles, Louis XIV is going to make a deliberate effort to create a, a very particular aesthetic world. And that he's going to require everybody who wants to be important in France, whether they're nobles who are desperately trying to hang on to their traditional privileges, or whether they are middle class people, wealthy people who would like to have access to more privileges, all of them are expected to attend him at Versailles and be part of this world that he creates there. So what does this world look like? Well, First off, we'll start with the palace. It was a massive undertaking to build the thing. It's enormous, and it's made in a very deliberately modern style. It's begun in the 1660s. It's going to be completed by 1685. And it doesn't look like your old-fashioned, I guess, stone castle-y castle type things. Instead, it's meant to look like this very cutting edge, beautiful but new modern kind of building. And it's absolutely covered in windows that have clear glass, which was a very luxurious item at the time. Very clear, completely transparent, beautiful, easy to see through type of glass and represented a new technological advance for France. It's meant to be light. It's meant to be airy. It's meant to be spacious and it is meant to be enormous. I mean, you can maybe pick out if I can show you these little dots in here these tiny little dots those are people over there so the, the place is huge and if you come over the hill where you are going to see Versailles you see these kinds of chimneys you can see the, the roof line and that's what you see first as you come up to it and the place looks like a city from a distance and then as you come over the hill you realize it's all one huge palace and the outside is not even close to the end of what it aesthetically is meant to do to people. As you move into the Palace of Versailles, the space is meant to be staggering. It's meant to remind you of the enormous wealth and power and grandeur of the king. So you have galleries like this one where you have massive scale paintings, oil paintings that cost a fortune to produce, uh, that are going to commemorate all the great battles of French history. Um, this is, uh, some of these are Charlemagne that you can, might be able to see here, but um, all the great battles of French history, they're meant to commemorate all the great sort of ancestral leaders of France, and they're meant to impress on people the importance and power and permanency of the, of the monarchy. At the same time that you have this hearkening back to tradition and this gilding, the absolute layering of gold leaf upon gold leaf upon gold leaf to impress upon you the wealth of the person who's producing this fantastic room, you also have the incredibly modern, see the skylight there, uh, ways of lighting the rooms, the buildings, the hallways to create something that no one had ever seen before. You have the beautiful parquet floors that are meant to impress you again with the level of artisanship, with the level of uh, capacity that the king has to create beautiful, grand, fantastic spaces. Outside the palace, uh, the grounds of Versailles were originally a hunting lodge. There's a lot of land around it. In order to provide enough water, they're going to have to dig a canal. You can see the canal down there on the bottom right. Um, and the grounds themselves are going to be reshaped into formal gardens. Some of them are still maintained so you can get an idea of what they looked like once upon a time. And formal gardens are very different from other types of decorative gardens in that uh, they are created to be maintained in um, often quite elaborate geometric shapes. There's a lot of like perfect cone-shaped 
um, sort of shaved down little trees. There's uh, a lot of pathways in perfect, crisp, straight lines with gravel that is all perfectly raked to be perfectly perfect. You have a lot of circular, like fountains that are perfectly circular. You have all of the plant life that is going to be trimmed and planted and shaped so that it is geometric and crisp and perfect. It's not growing the way it wants to grow. It's growing according to the plan of the gardener, according to the plan that is approved by the king. And that's meant to send a message. Uh, the fountains, the canal with its straight banks, making no effort to make, look, look, make it look like a natural feature at all. Uh, all of these are meant to send uh, a message that even nature can be tamed. Even nature will follow the order that is imposed by the king. There is going to be uh, a plan and everybody's going to get with it. This is carried to such an extent in the gardens at Versailles. I, I don't know how visible it is. You might be able to see this, but it's grown up quite a bit in the meantime. It was a, There was a forest around Versailles. It was a hunting lodge originally. And Louis XIV uh, orders a big section of the forest kind of cut down and pulled out and then replanted. He wanted it to be trees, but he orders the trees replanted in straight lines. That's how far he takes this idea of the formal gardens. There's another, uh, I guess, I suppose it's a bit of trivia, a thing that's worth kind of knowing. Um, in order to create enough water to support the gardens and to support the palace itself, as I mentioned, a canal had to be dug to bring water in from a nearby river. But even with the canal, there isn't enough water pressure to keep all of the fountains, which are fed purely by gravity, there's no actual pumps at this point, to keep all of the fountains working at the same time, there just isn't enough pressure. And so there was an official person whose job it was to know where the king was at all times and so he could run ahead of him and make sure that any fountain the king looked at was turned on so this person's job was to run ahead turn on fountains the king might see turn off the fountains that the king is not going to see and make sure that the king never had to look at a fountain that wasn't turned on so as we can see the king is creating a view a fabulous, luxurious, over-the-top palace on the inside, on the outside, even nature ordered according to his plan. You can see this, I suppose you could say, most strikingly in the Hall of Mirrors. And if you notice this picture, it's a grand and beautiful and enormous hallway. It's got fantastic, lavish, gorgeous oil paintings on the ceiling. It's got fantastic, gorgeous, lavish um gold leaf decoration on absolutely everything. It's got fantastic, gorgeous, lavish crystal chandeliers all over the place. It's got a fantastic uh, parquet floor. But the most important thing about the Hall of Mirrors has to do with the arrangement of big, beautiful, clear glass mirrors arranged exactly opposite and in the same size and shape as these beautiful, gorgeous, elaborate, clear glass windows. Now, if you are walking down the hall, and you were to turn your head and look out the window, what you would see would be the formal gardens. Nature itself shaped according to the king's wishes. If you were to look the other way, what you see are mirrors. And this more than anything encapsulates the message that Louis XIV is trying to send. In the palace at Versailles, there is one view that is acceptable, one way of looking at the world. And it is the world the way the king wants it. He is promoting this idea of absolute monarchy, of the king having complete control. And he uses Versailles to continue and create and nurture that idea. He requires absolutely everybody who wants a job, who wants a favor, who wants anything from the king to attend him at Versailles, sometimes for months at a time, sometimes for years. And they have to stay there. They have to take part in court life as he sees it. And in doing that, they end up having to spend a ton of money. He expects everyone to dress uh, as befits their station and as befits uh, their role as attending on the king. And so that means they have to pay for enormously elaborate outfits. I don't know if you can see them in great detail, but you can see these are soldier outfits and yet they have lace on top of lace, puffy sleeves. Uh, the dresses of women have yards and yards and yards of fabric, so much fabric. They have to create um, 
panettiere. They have to create these uh, kind of like wicker basket like structures that they strap over their waist so that they can drape their skirts over even more space because their physical body isn't big enough to hold as much fabric as they're trying to wear. There's And the more elaborate, the more lavish, the more gorgeous all of these clothes are, the more the king approves. And the more the king approves, the more you're likely to get what you were after if you're one of these courtiers, if you're one of the people attending him at Versailles. And so people try to outdo each other. They try to compete with each other. And it costs a flipping fortune. Every one of those dresses is the equivalent of like a Bentley. And men's clothing wasn't any cheaper or less elaborate. And so it cost a fortune to attend the king and to get his favor and to get his attention. And so the king has a, a sort of a method to this madness. He doesn't want people just to spend money for the sake of spending money. When he has his nobles attend him at Versailles, what he's doing is he's uh, putting a lot of pressure on them to spend a lot of money while they do that. And the more money they spend, the less they have available to cause trouble. The less they have to stir up political resistance, the less they have to pay for their own private armies, the less they have to cause him issues. And the more they have to bend over backwards to please him, the more it reinforces in their minds that he's the one who's powerful. He's the one who's making all of the choices. He reinforces this by having really elaborate codes of etiquette at the palace at Versailles, which he requires everyone to attend to. For instance, if you wanted to enter a room where the king was, you had to stand outside and scratch on the door with the little finger of your right hand. The little finger down, oh, you have to scratch on the door. And there would be a footman standing outside the door who could hear this and open the door. And the given reason for this, of course, is that you can't be the king and have people knocking on doors, disturbing things you might be thinking or saying. And so therefore, if you wanted to enter a room with the king in it, you weren't allowed to knock. You had to be very unobtrusive. But the psycho psychological impact of this, of course, is that it reinforces to people who are very rich and very powerful in their own right in many cases that they are not nearly as powerful as they would like to think they are. It makes them feel small. It also is an opportunity to do something that Louis is turning to his profit. If you are a person who is wealthy, if you're a banker or a merchant or you're somehow gotten to accumulate quite a lot of wealth, but you don't have a noble title, you're not part of the traditional nobility or aristocracy, that can change. If you go to Versailles, if you can find a way to be useful to the king, often by giving or lending him money, uh, the king might choose to reward you by creating a title for you, by allowing you to move up from being not just wealthy, but also in that nobility. Uh, so many people become part of this that it becomes, there's a new kind of name for it, the nobility of the robe. The nobility of the sword is the traditional nobility, the people who earn their right to be a duke with their fighting in the king's army. But the nobility of the robe are people who are rewarded by the king for whatever service, probably bureaucratic or monetary or something along those lines. They're usually not given any land uh, to, or estates to administer. Instead, they're simply given the title and allowed into this club so that their kids would be considered social peers and can marry into the noble families of uh, the actual old fashioned traditional nobility. And they can move in those circles and consider themselves upper class. And you would think that it seems like well, I don't know what you're really accomplishing here. But lots, lots of the wealthy people who are middle class in France are going to be falling over themselves in order to get into this club. And so they end up really lining the king's pockets even further. And the other thing that he accomplishes by having everybody attend him at Versailles is that it gives him the ability and excuse to keep an eye on them in a very literal way. He makes them all appear in this palace everywhere in Versailles. Everything's mirrors, a hall of mirrors, every hall everywhere, but every room, every salon, every everything is covered in mirrors and it's surrounded by people who are competing with you if you're one of these nobles uh, for the king's favor and so it's this atmosphere of competition. It's this atmosphere of suspicion. It's this atmosphere where nobles who have traditionally been able to go around thinking themselves very important, powerful people are made to feel small and insignificant. And all of it contributes to what Louis XIV is trying to accomplish. He's trying to make himself the important figure in French government. And he's undercutting the nobility in order to do that. Now, 
he's got some military ups and downs. He had, as I mentioned, expanded his army. They'd conquered a bunch of territory on the border with what is now Germany and the Netherlands. Um, and, well, it was the Netherlands then. But in any way, he conquers some uh, territory along the border. He has a whole bunch of success. He's creating this absolute monarchy. France is becoming an economic powerhouse. And it, all of this is creating quite a bit, as you probably can imagine, of suspicion and resistance elsewhere in Europe. The English Civil War has come and gone and is now over. They are starting to recover. They'd like to be economically uh, competitive with France. So they're kind of an automatic, uh, I guess, adversary. The Dutch, too, are nervous about uh, French expansion. The Holy Roman Emperor is nervous about it. And so all of them look over at what France is doing with this absolute monarchy, with the, the modernization of their government, with uh, the undercutting of the nobility, the expansion of the power of the king, and the expansion of their territory, and think to themselves, we've got to do something about this. We've got to, we've got to come up with something here. So um, they begin to form alliances. The most famous of these is the League of Augsburg, where England, Spain, Sweden, the Dutch Republic, the Holy Roman Emperor, and assorted German princes, those small German principalities that used to be part of the Holy Roman Empire, are going to join together to create an alliance, the purpose of which is to limit the power of France. And there's going to be a series of skirmishes and battles fought at the end of Louis XIV's life on the borders where he's not as successful as once he was, and he's going to have to give up a little bit of territory and give it back, but he hangs on to most of it. Uh, also in 1685, Louis XIV achieves so much influence and power that he is going to revoke the Edict of Nantes. He's got so much an effective control over France that he is going to make it no longer possible, no longer allowed to be Protestant in France. And he gets away with this. And he doesn't necessarily uh, launch into a huge persecution campaign. There will not be thousands and thousands of Protestants arrested and slaughtered or anything. But he does revoke the Edict of Nantes and um, is going to make it no longer a, a kind of individual choice what your faith will be in France. Okay, so along the same lines of everybody ganging up on Louis XIV um, and creating a whole slew of powerful enemies, Louis XIV is going to end up embroiled in a war that uh, is entirely predictable. He, like almost all of his contemporaries in Europe, is going to follow a policy of marrying cousins. He marries his cousin Maria Theresa of Spain. Everybody else is marrying their first cousins. They're all married to each other. And we have that big fish in a small gene pool problem that we've talked about in lecture prior to now. It's going to happen again and again. And this is one of the more striking examples. What happens with the War of Spanish Succession? This is toward the end of uh, Louis XIV's life. But what happens with that war is that and you absolutely do not have to remember these relationships. But what happens with that war is that uh, Charles II, there he is kind of in the middle. Charles II, uh, the King of Spain, is going to die in 1700. And he dies without an heir. And the debate comes up, what will happen now, now that the, the King of Spain is dead? Because if you follow this complicated nest of relationships, the next person in line for the throne since he has no children, you could have a debate about. It could either be uh, his wife's second husband, Leopold I, and also his cousin, second cousin, or you could follow the other line of succession and say that Charles's half-sister's son, his nephew, Louis Le Grand, who is standing in line to inherit France, is really his closest, uh, I guess, blood relative. Certainly that's what Louis XIV says. He says, hey, my son is the next one in line to be king of Spain. And so he presses that claim. He is resisted by everybody. Um, there are Spanish nobles who resist. The Holy Roman Emperor is going to put forward his own claim, as we mentioned, uh, on, him, on behalf of himself and on behalf of his son. There is going to be uh, resistance from England, from 
uh, the Netherlands, from everybody, because what nobody wants is France and Spain joined together to control everything in one huge empire. They really don't want that to happen. And so a war begins, and it's going to drag on for some years to prevent that from happening. But Louis XIV is not going to give up on it. So they're going to fight forth and back and back and forth. It's going to get fairly nasty. Louis XIV is eventually going to win a series of victories, but he can't absolutely steamroll over his enemies, so they come to a compromise. And in that compromise, what they agree is this. Louis XIV's um, second, well, his, uh, his grandson, his second grandson, Philip, Duke of Anjou, will be named as the successor. He's going to become king of Spain, Philip V of Spain, and ruled Spain, but he will be excluded from France. So uh, the throne of France should go to Louis le Grand, and then it should technically go to Louis's eldest son. Uh, but what it absolutely cannot go to is Louis's second son, Philip. This person is prohibited legally, absolutely by treaty, from inheriting both France and uh, Spain. And since he's prohibited by treaty, that the compromise was reached, they draw up an agreement, and uh, they agree that that's how it's going to go down. So, Philip, uh, Louis XIV's grandson, is going to inherit Spain, and then there's going to be supposed to be a line of succession to inherit France separately. Here's an interesting thing, though, and I want you to notice this. Take a look at some of these death dates. Charles II, the King of Spain, died in 1700. Louis XIV is not going to die until 1715. His son and successor, the Dauphin, that's just the birth that he heir to the throne in France, is going to die in 1711. Philip, Duke of Anjou, is going to live a good long time, but he's prohibited from inheriting France. The grandsons, if you go down to them, the eldest grandson is going to die in 1712, uh, three years before Louis. And then the third grandson is going to die in 1714, the year before. And all of this together, what it's going to mean is that by the time Louis XIV dies, despite the fact that he has several sons, despite the fact that he had several grandsons, the next person in line for the throne is going to be his great-grandson, who will become Louis XV, and who is only five years old. Also, a consequence of the War of Spanish Succession, in order to sweeten the deal where uh, Louis XIV's uh, grandson will be allowed to inherit Spain, he has to give up territory, the territory of Acadie over here, uh, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, uh, is part of New France, and it's given over to the British in exchange for accepting this whole War of Spanish Succession deal. And this is going to cause ongoing strife and problems in North America. The French settlers in Acadie are not going to take this line down. They're going to resist for several years, and there's going to be this kind of conflict and war that will be going on there. And it's going to stretch on and eventually lead into another conflict, which we'll talk about next time in lecture, uh, the Seven Years' War or the French and Indian War, which we'll talk about that next time as well. So, at long last, this absolute monarchy is going to come to a close with Louis XIV dying and the next person in line being his great-grandson, only five years old. And this is particularly bad luck. We'll talk about why in more detail in the next lecture. But it's particularly bad luck in part because Louis XIV instituted a lot of radical change. By the end of his life, there was pushback against that. Uh, his political enemies had started joining together in order to try to provide a successful alliance against France. Also, inside France itself, the nobility is not happy. They're looking for a chance to push back against uh, the consolidation of royal power. Also, the middle class, you'd think they'd be pleased with the expansion of their influence under Louis, but there are, and now that the door has been cracked open, they're more interested than ever in trying to get more access to power and turn into trying to leverage their wealth and turn it into political independence. And so as a result, there's this great uncertainty in France. You have this boy king, he's a child, there's a debate over who's actually going to run things, and all of the changes that Louis had put in place to consolidate power in his own hands is left in the hands of a child. So, that's it for today. Thanks for listening.